gentlemen and welcome to the 29th episode of the Little Thespian Podcast. On today's episode, we talk to a gifted, talented actor, musician, and writer. His name is Dusty Elderly. So without further ado, let's hop into episode 29 of the Little Thespian Podcast. Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 29th episode of the Little Thespian Podcast. On today's episode, we talk to a gifted, talented actor, writer, and musician, his name is Dusty Elderlays. How are you, Dusty? Hello, hello. Thank you. I'm I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Good, good. I'm glad, bud. I'm good. Um, and I'm so glad to have you on. It's Thank been you. a long time coming, bud, because I mean, fifteen dogs was so long ago, but I it's oh, like yesterday, bud. Me. It's I like peaked. yesterday. That's when I peaked. I peaked at fifteen dogs. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, you... Like I still talk to people, like my friend group. Um. Mm -hmm. Because everybody has had, you know, changes in how their body looks thanks to the pandemic. And I still like my, I've gotten, I mean, I haven't gained like a lot of weight, but like I'm not as skinny as I, because I used to be underweight when we did 15 dogs. But I remember at the end of 15 dogs, my thighs were huge because of the physicality. And like I could like barely fit into my suit pants. And now like I try to put my suit pants on and they don't fit, but for, a different reason and i'm just like damn it <laughs> i was so skinny jacked and i want to get back to that and I, I text i text uh i text the director of 15 dogs recently i was like yo can you remount that and cast me in it so i can get jacked again <laughs> honestly <clears throat> the guys that played all those 15 dogs oh. i don't know how you guys did it i had to do it for like what a minute or two maybe five yeah. minutes tops you guys and I was sick for the first two weeks of like week and a half of rehearsals. So I couldn't, I was like, I don't remember what, I think I had some sort of flu, but I, and obviously like now you look back at that and like, I was still going to rehearsals sick. Whereas like these days you'd be like, no, you stay as far away from everyone as possible. But like, I still, I had some sort of cold where I couldn't do the physicality. So I was watching everybody else do it. And I was like, fuck, I'm going to have to catch up. And then, yeah, that physicality was exhausting. And even I, like watching them, I was like, yeah, it looks fine. And then I did it and I was like, oh, that first six hour rehearsal of doing that shit. I was like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be tough. And like this you be went tough. from beginning to end too. You were the last dog standing. Yeah. Oh <laughs> so... my God. And it was, it was exhausting, especially because, um, I mean, we didn't have any breaks. It's like doing leg day every day for a month and a half. And you get maybe one, like one off day, one or two off days, but like, it doesn't give me the time to recover. And listen, that show, like dress, what was it? The first dress rehearsal, I tore both of my toes open. So I was like every show before the show, I'd be binding my toes um, backstage because 
for our dress rehearsals, I was wearing shoes because my toes were, my toes were torn. So I had band-aids, but I couldn't wear my orange Nikes on stage. It like, that would totally take everybody out of it. So I was binding my toes with um, like flesh color bandage and like um, some like injury tape or whatever. And I would remember that like halfway through the show, I'd have to go and redo it, but we didn't have an intermission. Yeah. And all of my changes were like, in a way, quick changes. I think the longest break I had in that whole show was maybe 10 minutes where I wasn't doing something. And even then I was getting ready. I was like waiting in the wings with like a piece of furniture to come on because I would have to, I would start in dog costume and then I would run off and switch into like the, the background actor that would like hold objects and then I'd have to run off, quick change back into my dog costume. And it was just so back and forth. And I remember there was a, like, in between shows. We had two days off in the run of the show. And <laughs> I would just, like, for hours soak in a hot bathtub, just hoping it would fix something. <laughs> because, the like, the nerves in my shoulders were, like, all messed up. And, like, I'd pinch the nerves in my shoulders. My toes were killing me. My legs hurt. And I was like, oh, my God. And, like that last day I was so excited to be done, but also I was just falling apart, especially because the author came. Oh, honestly, that, I that remember show us hearing that, like that he was coming yeah. and I'm like, okay, now pressure's on. You probably shouldn't have told us that like yeah. 10 seconds before going on. I remember like all the texts, they were like, oh yeah, the, the author is coming to see the show, but we're not going to tell you which show. We'll tell you after, like once he has seen it, then we'll tell you. And it, it was the last day. And then the it was our last two shows. On. And we hadn't heard anything yet. So I was like, this guy's coming to one of these shows today. And then we went to walk off stage and all the all the design designers and technicians were standing at the door being like, no, go back on stage. And I out loud went, fuck off. <laughs> this is the one he saw. <laughs> I mean, it was a, it was a really it was a good, good show, one. but I was like, fuck. <laughs> like, really like... And then all the house lights come on and like, yeah. bruh, I remember Zach coming on and I'm like, oh, okay. I'm standing behind everyone crying behind my mask. And I was like, I don't want anybody to look at me. Nobody look at me. <laughs> Nobody look at me. No, but uh, like, that's just such a like sad show from be- yeah. almost beginning to end. So like even holding back all that emotion too, mm-hmm. when the author comes on stage like when does that ever happen like it doesn't it doesn't and i remember like i i met him very very briefly after the show i spoke to him for maybe half a second and he just he just looked at me and uh he like pointed at me and he went prince and i went yeah that was me i was so excited and he was he was talking to he was talking to uh one of the other actors <laughs> and he was like i really loved the way you like would tilt your head and like sniff the ground and like all like the little things you did and i was like yeah, i was a dog <laughs> i was just like i was just like verbal diarrhea i didn't know how to talk anymore that's the thing i don't think he ever thought that anyone would ever make an acting version of yeah. his of its piece I but can't imagine so what that must well. have been like on his end. Like, imagine you write this thing and you're like, I'm going to write this story about dogs and if they had human consciousness and it's going to be, you know, and it's like you put, you don't expect some guy, you know, halfway across the country to go, I'm going to make a play about that and I'm going to get a bunch of college students to be dogs. And then it worked and you're like, oh my God. I mean, thinking about it now, obviously we were in it so we're going to be biased about it oh, but it does work right yeah. where you think about it human conscience okay well how do you really portray that with humans exactly yeah right the only form it would kind of take would be theater yeah especially like it also really changed my perspective on having dogs as pets and how you appreciate them i think it's it's weird like after that show i've never looked at my dog the same the same i'm like he's just because i'm like something <laughs> yeah like just, but also just like that that show really put into perspective for me like how dogs perceive time in a sense like how um like madge just waited and waited and that waited. killed me every time that, that ripped happened. my heart out or like or like with with benji you know just like he's like starving and he's not really sure like how much time has passed and he's just locked in this house and you're like, oh my god! 
Well, even dude. even and now anytime anytime I see like if if I close my door and I'm like, all right, I'll see you later, Barney. Like every time I'm like, I wonder how much time like how he perceives the time when I'm gone. It's insane. Well, that's the thing. Even at the end with Prince and uh, his owner Kim. Yeah. Right. Just the running back and whatnot, bruh. Trying to get through that, like just yeah. I can only imagine, but yeah, I like every night because especially with like. I mean, it was, it was, I think made easier by the people that I was, that we were working with, you know, like we were, we were really lucky to have some like really insanely talented actors, actors and actresses and people who were just so supportive. And like every night it was so hard for me not to break when I was running towards Kaye. <laughs> when i was and she was like just like smiling at me and it was so hard for me not because like as like if you remove yourself from the situation and you put yourself like third person you're looking at yourself it looks so stupid it's so ridiculous it's just a guy running in all fours with a dog mask on it looks so dumb but like also i'm just falling apart because it's so heartbreaking at the same time (laughs) No, but that's the thing too. Like watching it back, I don't know if you've watched the the DVD. I I have. I've watched it twice. The first time I watched it, um, was with a couple of the guys who were in the cast, and I was having a hard time appreciating it because some of them were just like, like they were making a drinking game out of it because they uh they had filmed it on different days, hmm. so. So some of the guys were like, oh, like, uh, you should take a drink anytime, uh, like, Dusty's shoes change colors. And I'm like, ha ah. and, and, like, we just come off the show. So I was, like, I was still all super emotional about it. And mm-hmm. I'm just, like, a sensitive person. So so I was, like, I couldn't fully appreciate it. But then I watched it once on, on my own a couple months later. And I was just, like, falling apart on my couch. It's It's, like beautifully filmed i mean they always are but yeah. like just i never thought that it looked like that because no one like anyone that's in acting doesn't usually get to see the end product right what mm-hmm. the audience sees and yeah. like just what zach did with making furniture and making these dogs come to life in a way you kind mm-hmm. of forget that it's humans doing it yeah and it's like it's it, it was very well done and yeah. uh yeah i look back at it very fondly man it's yeah it's it's but that's also just one of those things where it's like it's so different from what you would expect to do everybody goes into theater thinking like of like either you know Tennessee williams arthur miller or musical theater you don't think i'm gonna be a dog in a show <laughs> right so it's just it was it's something it was so different from anything that i had done up to that point because um i had an acting teacher who was very very fond of like the the golden era of theater american realism and so all of like all of my time in my acting classes was poured into those plays like death of a salesman stuff like that where we read all my sons in class and and we would do scene studies on that and and on streetcar and then we did 15 dogs and it was so different than anything I had read or anything that I had even tried to, to, to do. And I was like, so intimidated when I got cast as Prince because like I wanted to be cast as a dog and I was, I'm so grateful that I was, but like, I remember when, um, the teachers when they're auditioning they'll be like just give us like a ranking on what you would like to play and we'll try if it's feasible and if it makes sense we'll try to give you something that you would like but ultimately we're going to go with what we think will challenge you or what's best for you and and what's best for the show and i remember like i put like the dog that i wanted was like frick or frack (laughs) yeah and then and then like prince was like down there because i knew it was a bigger role i didn't think i would get it and I was like, I'll just put that as like my third option. And then I got I got Prince and I was like, holy shit. Holy shit. I have to I have to do some shit. I gotta pull something out of my ass. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Because 
you know, I was like, oh, yeah, for like a little shithead dog, you know, that, that I could do That's you know, that's sort of in my wheelhouse of like comic relief sort of thing. And then it was like this, this actually really emotional thing. I was like, oh, no, I'm scared. <laughs> and like, he's a poetic dog. He speaks yeah. a lot, <laughs> Prince. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, you killed him. Man. And I'm not just Thank saying you. that because you're, you're in it. <laughs> but bruv, it, it, it was really good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, actually, I want to hop back to when you were talking about um, like the beginning of your acting. Yeah. How exactly do you get into theater? I know. Well, it's been, it, it might have been a while back. Been, it was a, oh, so I have a bit of a complicated family history. Um, but one of my fondest memories growing up was when I was like I think nine or ten and I was living in Florida and um so my my sisters and I after dinner like when we would finish eating my family um was very like European my dad his parents are from France and um like his older siblings were born in France so it was very much like you sit at the table and you talk as a family until everybody's done eating then you're excused so my sisters and i had this thing where our trick to getting excused from the table early was while my mom and dad kept eating and talking we would go do miniature plays like at the end of the table and we had our dining room had like an archway that like showed like went into the piano room so we'd use the piano room as our stage and every night we would just reenact the same scenes from a bug's life where it was like all those like the caterpillars and they were all like killing each other and shit and my sisters would sabotage me every night. And I would, I was so serious about it. And that was like the first time I got into like doing anything like theater wise. And then um, <clears throat> my parents split up and I moved back to Canada with my mom and I didn't really think about it at all as an option. And like, even in, in ninth grade, I wanted to be until I was 15 years old, I wanted to be a zoologist because my mom told me that only a zoologist could open up their own zoo. And I wanted to be a zoologist and open up my own zoo so that I could have a pet snow leopard. Like that was, that was, that was, this is my goal in life for entirely too long. Like at 15 years old, I was started thinking, Hey, maybe I should like switch this up. Cause this is kind of dumb. Like that doesn't make sense. Um, and that's when I got into writing and I started focusing on English and, um, it was around then that one of my friends forced me to join the improv team in my high school. And I feel horrible because um, he had been on the improv team for years beforehand, but he's the one that pressured me into auditioning and I auditioned and I got in and he didn't. Oh. And I felt so bad. I felt so bad that I almost left, but he told me to stay. So I, I did that and I, I loved it. And then I'm, I'm, I guess this is a running theme in my life is I like, I met this girl on the improv team and I, I wanted to just spend more time with her and she was in the musical. So I was like, I've never been in a musical. So I joined the musical and we were doing wedding singer that year and I got really into it. And then, uh, and then she broke up with me, but I was like, but I really liked being in that musical. That was fun. So I just kept doing it. And then by the time I was about to graduate high school, I was like, I think I could do something with this. So I auditioned for Niagara College and Abbott and I got into both. I don't know how, I don't know how, cause my auditions were atrocious. They were so bad. And I broke every single rule for my audition for Abbott, but I got in and I got in and I was like, Oh my God, now I have to actually, I have to, I got to commit. I got to try. So I just, I kind of just did my best from then. Like I got it. I got into Abbott. I showed up for my first day. I should, as everybody does coming out of high school, they got a little bit of an ego. I got there and I was like, yeah, I'm hot shit. And day one, we were doing just like basic exercises and everybody who went before me, I, I just I watched all these kids and I was like, oh my God, I suck ass. These people are so much better than me. Honestly, like, it's yeah. such a humbling experience seeing like your classmates act in front of you. And you're like, oh God, I can't compete with that. <laughs> literally like at the beginning yeah. like that was uh, i didn't come straight out of high school going into habit mm -hmm. but i i kind of still had that okay i know that i want to be an actor i, I got mm -hmm. this and then the minute you walk in 
and they're like, okay, we're going to be doing scenes or whatever, or we're going to be doing mm -hmm. classic, what, like basic, basic stuff. Okay, cool. What did I sign up for? Holy yeah. crap. Yeah. I'm not on the same playing level. <laughs> And you like continuously, you're like, yeah. whoa. It's like, I somehow found my way out of minor leagues and now I'm like pro tour. What am I doing? Like, I'm like, I did a drama class in high yeah. school. That's, that's basically yeah. my, right. And, and then it's a total I culture in. shock too, because the, like the, the, the classes that you have in high school, like even the teachers don't really take it super seriously. They're not like, Hey, you need to be professional. Right. So then you go from that to a college setting where everybody's like, I want to make a career out of this. I'm taking this seriously. I'm focusing on the work. And then you also have like at the same time, people who are still acclimating to that. And it's just so weird having to like shift, um, shift your focus so much and actually like try. And it's not just about, Oh, I'm fucking around with my friends. And it's entirely like, I'm doing my best so that I can make something out of this because this is, potentially going to be my bread and bread my bread and butter going into life and that's the thing too like they, they ask you at the first day or whatever they're like um so so what have you been doing before this like why exactly do you want to go into this and then that you go around and you're like okay i feel very unprepared about this question you know what i mean and like mm -hmm. it's true like with drama they're basically no one's taking that seriously they're like yeah. okay well okay cool um you were okay, you, you want to you wanna act basically during this time period or you want to mm -hmm. have fun, right? And again, you're right. The teacher is kind of just, okay, free period, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it's true. You go into a setting like John Abbott and they're like, yep, okay, this is a professional theater program. You're not a kid anymore. You're an adult. Act like it. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm it's barely an adult, you know, I'm, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're basically saying like, for me to play. So I know, am I right? actually an adult? Like, like, even at this point, I'm 25. I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> no. You expect me at 18 to have my <laughs> shit together. Oh. And especially like, bro, with that, like, it, it's true. Like, I, I, I personally love the fact that I took that leap. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't really take the leap to do theater because they're scared yeah. to or oh my god the pressures of money mm -hmm. very real pressure guys don't get me wrong <laughs> yeah oh my god <laughs> um but that's the thing like <clears throat> all i can say honestly is just take the leap i don't know if you have yeah. any more words of wisdom for it or words of wisdom for that in terms of acting is take take the leap but also if you take that leap and you're not feeling it don't be afraid to, to shift course. Like I know, I mean, my, my class started with 35 people and they accepted 38, which is an insane number for like the size of the spaces that we have at Abbott. Like I still remember like all the teachers are like the magic numbers, 12, the magic numbers, 12. And they accepted 38 people from my class with, with Terry and 35 showed up and we graduated with 23 and like, that's a lot of people mm -hmm. that left and all of those people left in first year. And I'm still friends with, with like some people who left, um, left the program early. Like I'm still friends with a lot of them. And I think they, they definitely made the right choice because, and that's not to say that they weren't good. Like some of them were phenomenal actors. Like some of them were amazing. It's just, this wasn't what they wanted to do or it was what they wanted to do, but the pressure was like not, good for their their health like it was just too much for them mental health wise so they they shifted focus and like some of them went into photography some of them just dropped out and pursued music and some of them just changed career paths entirely and that's totally okay i mean i think i think there's too much pressure on people to know what they want to do from the get-go right there's so much pressure. like even you're asking fourth graders what do you want to be when you grow up and like expecting us to know how the world works and be able to make a calculated decision on what we want to do with our futures. Right. And even, even in high school, like we don't know how to do our taxes, but we're supposed to know what job we want. <laughs> like, I can't even, I can't even scramble an egg, but I know I want to be an astronaut. Like what? <laughs> right. It's crazy, man. And it's yeah. true. I mean, a lot of people do drop out of 
prof. I know we started with 32 and ended with 16. Yeah, you guys had a lot too. So we literally I remember cut. I remember I remember when you guys were in first year, I went in for one of your movement warm-ups and there was no room. I was like, oh my god. And like, bro, literally, we cut half in three mm-hmm. years. And I'm like, I didn't expect that. Like, okay, obviously you're fully in it, right? You don't expect mm-hmm. I'm not gonna be the one to drop out, I'm not gonna be the one to drop out. Yeah. And then you're like, oh my god, everyone is dropping. Yeah. Because you guys graduated with, with 16, right? I think I remember there being 16 of you yeah. at your cabaret. Yeah. So we had four guys and 12 girls. Yeah. I remember, too, like, all the guys in my class were super jealous about that. Like, we had graduated, and then we saw you guys going into third year with four guys, mm-hmm. and all of us were like, oh, my God. The guys have, like, free reign of whatever they want. See, that was the thing, too, where, like, <laughs> Okay, I, I kind of want to be in Faustus or I want to mm-hmm. be in Pride. Okay, cool. Okay, guys, we only have four guys for the third years. So, like, most of you are probably going to be a part of Faustus. I'm like, well, okay, no worries. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's true. Like, four guys compared to we had, like, I think almost the same amount of guys as girls at the beginning. Like, we had a yeah, decent amount yeah, of guys. And a, then, like, yeah, a lot more guys dropped out of your class. Yeah. Bro, it's crazy. And, mm-hmm. like, that's for us, thing. we had a pretty even split. We had a pretty even split, and it got pretty competitive. We're yeah. <laughs> well, like, that's the thing, too, where, like, this, like, the competitiveness at, at like, third year, like, mm-hmm. it tends to, like, after a while, again, you get very close to one another. Mm-hmm. But then with the second years, you're kind of like, okay, well, they have way more guides now. Mm-hmm. So more than likely, any role that, like, needs to be filled is more than likely going to be a second year now because there's just so many guys, right? Yeah. But that's the thing. A lot of guys tend not to go into theater. And mm-hmm. it's crazy. And you can kind of yeah. see it here, right? I mean, you can you can see that even with the stigma. Like, I remember, I don't know. This was, do you remember Jack's Secrets? Yeah. <laughs> and then they made a whole different account right after it. Okay. So when they, whenever they made Jack Confessions, I, I, accidentally, I, I accidentally started a bit of a beef with the football team. And... <laughs> Rather than just be like, all right, you guys have like whatever. They they really went in on me for being a theater kid. I don't even remember. It was like some dumb thing of like somebody asking if there were open tryouts. And I think our team had been on like a losing streak or something. So I was like, you're better off playing house league. Like I just made some dumb like offhanded joke. But I didn't know that they had just come off of like losing playoffs. (laughs) and they were in a bad mood and they took it out on me and they went oh you're just a theater kid like take your l and they were taking screenshots of my profile picture in my prince costume and like putting that in the comments so i was like why are they like why are they so like why do they have to be so macho about hating theater like how is that how is that manly and they were like threatening to fight me in the halls and i was like do it (laughs) like i won't fight i'm an adult hit me Hit me in public and see what happens to you. Like, what is this? This isn't high school. That is assault. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's laws. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't get it, man. Like, there, there's a weird stigma about it. And there, mm-hmm. I think there always has been because only women do theater. It's very, you know, emotions and whatnot. Yeah. But that's yeah, guys are guys really shy away from emotion. And I think that's another driving factor. Because I remember even when I was in high school, I hesitated to to do drama class because i was like "Ooh, emotions is gross See, I, that's I, the thing I'm, i uh, never cry i'm I, a man I, I went i'm a 15 in... <laughs> year old man <laughs> but bro honestly i went into like do improv and whatnot right mm-hmm. and like at the beginning i'm like yeah this seems weird i'm just having fun right mm-hmm. i never thought that i'd be like full-on committing to emotional things like that yeah way back when but then like that's the thing bro like the minute you take that leap and jump into it i find that it's even better to kind of just express all parts of yourself you know what i mean like yes you can be macho and still be in theater guys don't (laughs) like (laughs) it still happens i mean and i mean i can speak from experience i literally wore no shirt for literally maybe 90 percent of my show yeah so guys it it can happen if you want to be macho and also be in theater. Like it happens. Yeah. But yeah, it's crazy. But then also there are some times when you got to switch it up. I have had to wear women's undergarments in class before. 
<laughs> that was weird. That was weird, but it was very eye opening. Those underwires suck. I never had the opportunity to do so. That never came up because of something yeah. we were doing something else. Yeah, but... sometimes scheduling gets in the way, but yeah, that was that was a really weird experience for me, especially because I was I was dating somebody in my class at the time when we were doing this exercise. But I was like, I had this and I was, it was weird. It was weird improv scene where I was like, I guess the teacher was trying to have us experience what it's like for like the opposite, um, like the norms for the opposite gender or whatever. So they had us dress differently. So I was wearing like women's clothing, but then the two girls in my scene were all like, they were both dressed up as dudes and I was dating one of them, but then I ended up kissing the other one. <laughs> And it's just like in those moments, you you forget that you're like, I got to remember that this is just a scene and that my girlfriend won't be mad at me. after. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to just let go of those things. But also it's like once you start to just open yourself up more, I think it's better for us as people. I think it's really I think more people should do theater school even for a year. And like I know the teachers say that constantly, like everybody should do at least a year of theater school just to like you know get used to their emotions and i think that would be great but nobody's gonna do it <laughs> see that's the thing like like i like i keep saying the the leap is basically just just do it like the thing is is drama seems to have this weird stigma that like you can only do it if you're very flamboyant or whatnot mm -hmm. but really like any human being can do it. The shyest kids do theater because they open up, yeah. right? Yeah, I used to be so shy as a kid. Same. I used to be super shy. Like, I, I couldn't talk to people when I was young. Yeah. And then look at us now. We're, we're talking to so many people yeah. so loudly. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, just the, the difference that it can make in anyone's life, I find. Mm -hmm. But just going to see theater no one sees theater anymore or seems like well, unless I mean, right you're an can, actor but... or not <laughs> well, we can't right now unfortunately yeah. Yeah, but I miss, I mean i miss live shows right like there's yeah. just something about it where you have this cathartic experience whether you're in it or whether you're watching it yeah you're having some cathartic experience and i feel like more people need to you know especially after yeah. this pandemic man they might need to just you kind just of that release feel, you know what i mean yeah I yeah I think there's there's if there's one thing that consistently makes me cry it's theater. I don't like I've seen I've seen you name it so many movies that are just like rip your heart out and I'm like yeah that was super emotional that was a great movie but like movies don't make me cry theater makes me cry and I don't know if it's the proximity or like you know or or the fact that you can tell that like these actors as much as they're putting on a performance to an extent, they're feeling these emotions in front of you. I don't know if that's part of it, but there's just something about the whole experience of seeing live theater that fucks me up. And like, that's even happy thing. shows, even happy shows. Like I remember at the end of Les Mis, this was the first thing. This was one of the shows that made me think I should do this. Cause I saw Les Mis on Broadway in 2014. And I remember even during the curtain call, I was just standing there clapping and crying and all my friends all, all these like bros in my class are all looking at me laughing They're like oh my god are you crying and i'm like it's just so good they all seem so happy to be doing this job that seems like their dreams literally I'm so happy for them honestly i had the exact same experience but i was with my best friend and mm -hmm. like he he's like not super into theater but like mm -hmm. okay he he enjoys film or whatnot but he, he went to go see les mis and i'm with me and i'm like bro this is gonna get like sad and he's like okay yeah yeah sure <laughs> and come the end of it we're both crying and we're like yeah. bro are you crying or am i crying like what's happening here and he's like you bro. no it's raining <laughs> and literally i'm like bro so how much do you like theater now yeah. and he's like yeah no I, I i feel why why you like it so much why you love yeah. it and it's just that experience man of like there are actually humans mm -hmm. going through this and it, whether it be comedy or whether it be uh tragedy you kind of go through this this journey with them 
Right. Yeah, and you connect you connect to that humanity and you connect them on such an emotional level, you're like, fuck, this is good. And that's the thing, like over a screen, you can feel it, right? Yeah. But like to some extent, because I can pause it. Yeah. Or I could be like, oh well, look at that that shot or whatever, right? How it yeah. looks. I get so distracted be. watching film now, thinking of like, oh, how did they frame that shot? Because of the acne for camera class, when I figured out that they have people like standing on boxes and, and then when I filmed something for the first time. And we had to do a close-up together and our noses were like basically touching. I was like, how do they do this? How the hell does like does Robert Downey Jr. and and Tom Holland, if they have to talk face to face, how can they they can taste each other's breath? Like what? Right. And like the same, like I was just in a film before uh in about December. Mm-hmm. And like you have like these weird angles that you do that like you're not even really talking to the person. You're kind yeah. of talking in front of you, and it's like, but I'm talking to you. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah, they're, when they're doing the shot reverse shots and stuff yeah. like that, you're just like, what? And you're like, wait a minute, like <laughs> this just seems very unnatural. Okay, I'm yeah. I'm glad it looks good, mm-hmm. but like I'm talking to legit like the wall. Yeah, <laughs> and like that's what I found. Like with acting, like you can practice it over and over and over again. Yeah, but when you're really with somebody, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. That's when the best stuff comes out. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think like some of the some of the things that I've been most like committed in has has always been theater. I think it's also just one of those things is like when you're when you're doing a show on stage. And this is why I think theater is always going to be like my baby. Like it's my like I prefer it in a sense as much as I love doing film and television work. You just have less things that you're thinking of when you're doing a show on stage. You're like, this is my playing space. And this is my partner. Like, this is my scene partner. I got to make sure that they look good. I got to give them as much as, as they can work with. I got to do my best for them and also for, like, everybody watching. That's it, right? And just remember your lines. But with, like, film, you're like, all right, where's the boom? I got to be, like, I have to direct my voice this way, but the camera's here, so I'm looking that way. But I got to be like, all right, you can hear me really well. and But I can't talk too loud. Otherwise, the mic might peak. So I have to be careful of like my levels, but also like I can't whisper because then they'll be able to tell. And and I don't don't look at the camera. Don't look at the camera. Look anywhere but the camera. Don't look at the crew. Also, don't look at the crew. And you're just like, there's so much shit going on in your head. And you're like, oh, wait, also, I got to act. And that's the thing. Like, they're so close to you, too. And yeah, I, I'm, and I know I'm that's something that you get thing, used to. But... but like, yeah, it's, it's I know that's something you get used to. But like, I I mean, because of the pandemic, like I got an agent right before the pandemic, like right before, like I did my show for Fringe. I, like I, I wrote fragments with, with um, my co-director at, for our theater company. We wrote fragments. We put it on for Fringe. At the same time, I had gotten an agent, and like my agent came to see the show too, and she loved it. And it was great, and I love her to death. She's amazing. And then I was getting auditions, and I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna like start trying to break in to the industry in Montreal. And then winter season is a lot slower. So I didn't get a lot because of winter. And then there was the pandemic. And I've gotten maybe three auditions like all year, which is because everything's just like crippled right now, right? It's so hard to do stuff. And like I've been, I've been sending, like I sent a, a couple of self tapes recently. And I know like once things pick back up, you know, I'll be, I'll be able to get more auditions again. But I'm just like, fuck. And it's like, it makes you feel like you're not doing anything because you're like, I'm because everything's so crippled right now. Like it's hard for me to, to get anything. And like, I got so close to uh, landing something I'd gotten sent, like sent to network for approval. And then like, right at the last second, they went a different direction. I was like, Fuck. But like, that's why, like when, when we all went into lockdown, I just started focusing on music because I was like, at least I feel like I'm working on something. I feel like I'm, pushing forward in some way even if i feel super stagnant stagnant in every other aspect of my professional life i'm i'm working on my music and that's something and i'm gonna have something tangible that i did to be able to say like i've created something i'm not just like giving up because for for a minute when you feel like you're not doing anything you just feel like what's the point because you don't feel motivated anymore. So it's really hard to stay motivated, especially when you can't do anything really to be motivated. Like I can't, I can't, I was right before 
right before I was going to go to open mics and start doing stand up. It was right then. And I had just written something out and it wasn't great. It was just the bones of something, something that I could workshop and like get into the flow of telling the story. And I never got to do it. And I was like, fuck. Like, it's just one of those things where you're like, you're about to just start doing things. And then now that you can't, you're like, what do I even bother doing now? So like, I'm really grateful that I have my music to focus on. Cause I don't know what I would do if I didn't, I'd lose my mind. <laughs> Honestly, I, I get that man. Like, that's why I've been doing the podcast. I need to be yeah. doing other stuff. Yeah. I can't stand, I can't, can't do one thing ever. Mm-hmm. Um, I always need to be doing something and like I was getting film and TV stuff Mm -hmm. and I'm like, cool. Awesome. And then the pandemic hit. Yeah. Like fully. And I'm like, I love how it hit. I love how it hit also like right as all of us were leaving college and about to start, like we were all right, getting and no cool. All right. I'll just go fuck myself. (laughs) Like, bro, I've been putting on self tapes and whatnot and we need to keep Mm -hmm. trying to, to do stuff during this time. But the issue with, with everything happening with COVID now, it's just kind of like, okay, well, you can do stuff, but basically by yourself, you yeah. know what I mean? Or anyone that I'm in close quarters with, it's a perfect time to do that now because, well, I don't really want to expose myself to the the rest yeah. of the people, you know what I mean? So like, I, I completely understand that, man. But yeah. let's talk about your music. So how exactly did you get in to That's... doing music, man? It was a bit of a roller coaster. It was a bit of a roller coaster. I never thought I <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna be really really depressing, but <laughs> I started teaching myself guitar in uh, drink fifteen dogs. That's when I started like messing around. Well, I had a really messy breakup, and then um, I started seeing somebody. And I was just, I just didn't know, I didn't know how to like deal with feelings. And I was realizing that like, I had never felt some of the things that I was feeling before. And I didn't know how to, how to process that. So I started writing poetry, which like, ha, yeah, all my friends were like, oh my God, you're so lame. But like, that was just how I was dealing with the emotions because I'd never felt a lot of it before. And then I started just like, jotting down soon the poetry became like more like a chorus sort of turned into like something that was like oh wait this could have a melody to it but I had no idea what I was doing and I started teaching myself guitar at the same time in the hopes that this girl might like me more because I was like I was just like I was I could tell like I don't know I don't know, like, you're in those situations where you're like, I feel like they only kind of like me. They're only kind of interested. And I just, I love everything about this person. And I'll do anything to to make them like me as much as I like them. And I know that, like, that's an unrealistic expectation to put on yourself, as if it's your responsibility. You can't make someone like you. Either they do or they don't, you know? But I was just like, maybe if I can play guitar, like, maybe maybe they might like me just a bit more. And I started teaching myself guitar and then these poems turned into songs, but I didn't know how to sing and play at the same time. (laughs) So like I had all these, all these love songs written out about like how much I was just like falling for this person, but I had no idea how to put a melody to it. And I couldn't even figure out how to sing and play at the same time. And I had a couple of nice finger picking melodies, but then I had no melodies for the lyrics. And, um, and then I went through another breakup and I just fell apart because I was like, I've never, I'd never felt all those things before. And now like that, I don't have this person that I'm writing about. It feels like my muse is gone. Um, and so th- those songs transformed into uh, breakup songs right as I learned how to sing and play at the same time. So now all of my songs are just about like, I don't know, just like dealing with all those feelings that you don't know. And like, you know, 
your friends are sick of hearing about how heartbroken you are, but you need to talk about it or you need to express it in some way and you don't know how to. So you're just like, I'm just going to buy. So I just wrote a bunch of songs and they started sounding kind of good. And I was like, oh shit, could I maybe do this? So um, I started recording. Well, I wrote, originally I had maybe two songs at the beginning of the pandemic um, that I had written while I was in Nova Scotia uh, visiting my family. Like right before the pandemic, I went to Nova Scotia. Uh, the first song I learned how to play was the stable song by Gregory Alan Isakov. It's one of my favorite songs of all time. And he's like one of my biggest influences. And so I was just like, I used that, like just the muscle memory of that song to teach myself how to sing and play at the same time. And then it was like, it was like opening up just the floodgates and suddenly like all these random lyric ideas that I had jotted down on my phone. Now I had a way that I could maybe turn them into songs and I did. So um, I was going to release a full album of 14 songs in September of 2020. And I bought a bunch of recording equipment. I was going to record it all myself. But then I realized I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I started recording some of the songs. And I started trying to master them, but I ran into all these issues where like my computer, the processor wasn't strong enough to handle the um, FL studios. And I wasn't smart enough to figure out FL studios. So I was just doing my best. And then finally I had, I kind of just like kicked myself into gear. I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit down. I'm going to figure it out to the best of my ability. So I recorded two songs I, um, with the help of a friend of mine, Michael Briganti, and then I mastered them. I had uh, another friend of mine, Violet Kay. She played uh, violin on my song, Santa de Bellevue, and she, she's amazing, and I'm so grateful that she did that because it makes the song sound better. Um, and then I recorded a music video in October, just like... I mean, it was, it was all like, we would always like, we're wearing masks and stuff like that. And except for these like one moment where we were kind of like standing apart. And I just, I was like, this is nice to be doing this and like working on that music. And then I'm finally like getting it all together. And so I'm, yeah. And then I, I called I, like, it's so, it's also so just like, stereotypically sad boy and i get i get ribbed a lot for it by my friends because they're like oh yeah you would name your album falling apart and i'm like well it's like in in it's with the theme because the 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 art is watercolor and it's like fall colors and and like obviously they just want to they just want to rip on you because they're your boys but <laughs> yeah i know i i just started falling in love with it and then like even now i still every now and then like I don't actively write songs. It kind of they, they kind of just pop into my head. Like I'll just be sad in my car, and then like I'll have an idea for a sentence. I'll be like, "Oh, I gotta write that down," and then hopefully I'll turn that into something later. So I have like three hundred notes in my phone of just random, like four word lyrics, or like maybe a a, a verse that I still haven't touched in in a year, but like maybe I will. That's incredible, man. Like and. It's good to hear the 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 story about it because mm -hmm. I remember like you just dabbling with strumming and whatnot, and I remember like your singing voice is lovely, man. Like mm -hmm. it really is. And Saint Anne de Bellevue, That's something I'm really self conscious about actually. <laughs> Saint Anne de Bellevue, man, it's it's a very very nice song. Uh, it will be linked down below, guys. So please go check that out. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, man, it's uh, it's good that like you have all sorts of things happening, and you did talk about fragments as well. How yeah. was also writing for you? Because I know like writing songs and writing mm. an entire play is hella different. Um, so different. And like I had the opportunity, I have written a play for the next fringe. But yeah. doing, like, just doing a play, like, writing a play, mm -hmm. how, how, if you had to kind of talk about it, how mm -hmm. exactly did that come to be? Fragments? Yeah. Uh, in, okay, so I started 
Well, my best friend and I uh, started a theater company, uh, Dewagata Junis Productions. And we needed a show for our first Fringe because we, we wanted to be in the Fringe Festival. And like the whole mandate of our theater company is to give um, like a platform for just emerging artists. But we had nothing. So we, we sat down. I had the bones of an idea for an old script that I was working on about... I completely repurposed it. I changed the whole thing because I was writing a show just about breakups, you know, or, or the, I just dealing with it. I was, I was working on a script for a screenplay. I wanted to make a short film about abusive relationships, but I wanted it to be um, when the person suffering the abuse is um, a male because that was something that I have have dealt with and I wanted to explore that. And I think I was using that script as sort of just a way for me to cope with what I had been dealing with. And I didn't know how to sort of put it into words. And then I set it aside because I had, you know, moved on from that relationship and I was in a, a, a relationship where I was, hel- I was happy. So I was like, I don't need this anymore. And so I took that script and basically took out everything in it except for like the two main characters and their names <laughs> that was it and i completely changed everything and so um myself and and my best friend we started um and, and you know you know Jaden. Yeah. um so we started working on that as a way to just explore relationships in general um, and I, I used it as a way to explore my successes and my failures in relationships. Um, not necessarily word for word, but I definitely did. I also pulled just moments every now and then there'd be like one line or one quote where it's something that somebody had said to me in like while dating or something that I had said to them while dating or in a situation that is similar. And we wanted it to be a show about um, about this relationship so like the first scene in the show was them breaking up and then the second to last scene of the show was the first time that they say I love you to each other and all of the scenes in the middle were these moments that make or break the relationship and it was not necessarily it was like somewhat non-linear in the sense that we had the end of the relationship at the beginning and then like the beginning of them saying I love you towards the end but everything else sort of happened in like a chronological order of like um, you know, the, 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 the boyfriend was like a struggling musician and he really wanted to make it as a musician and his girlfriend was in law school and they had different, they had different plans for their futures, but it's like one of those things where it's like you grow together and then you grow apart because you're realizing that the paths that you are, you're on are just totally different. And um, we had this whole scene where like the more that he, the more success he got in music, the more he needed to travel and the more he had to be away. And she couldn't go along with him. But at the same time, he felt bad in the sense that like he can't uproot her. He, she's devoted all this time to to following this career path. She spent four years in in law school and he can't expect her to move across the country with him. You know, and it's like it, and I remember like in that there's a a big fight that they had where she's trying to reason with him being like, I can, I can transfer my credits. I can go to a new school. And he's just like, that's not fair to you. I can't do that to you. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like communication breaks down and we wanted to just explore that and how that feels and just like how much it hurts when you want like you both so desperately want to save things but you can't and then um yeah it it was this roller coaster because i i never wanted to direct anything i i'm much more of like a collective creation type of person i i hate being in charge (laughs) because i just I value everybody's opinions too much and their input too much. And I just so badly want to make something 
where everybody feels like they made it. Even though like, like, but that's a totally different thing. Like my music, I'm just like, I made this, I wrote this and like, I want to have other people on it, but I also don't want to let them down if I don't like it and feel like I should cut it. So it's just easier if I don't. But with like playwriting or script writing, I just, I feel like if I have a couple more cooks in the kitchen, I met my best, which is why I was like so eager when Jay was helping me write, because I was like, this is so much better because if we can have more voices, it doesn't feel like all of the characters are just me. Right. Like, cause that was in our first draft, like all the characters, they talked like me. And I remember sitting with the actors during our rehearsals, like rewording, I, I would just tell the actors, like, just say, just get the idea of that sentence across how you feel the character would say it. Because I'm not, I'm no Shakespeare. I I can write a story, right? But I'm still early on in my career. I still have a lot to learn. And at this point, like a lot of my characters sounded the same. So I was like, I don't know how to, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to write for female characters because there's all these experiences that I've never had, you know, um, I'm, I'm a white dude. Like I've had it comparatively easy. So like, I don't, I just, I don't know. I struggle to write things the way that people actually talk other than me and all the characters sounded the same. So I was just like, yo guys go nuts. Just say things how you think they would say them, say things how you would say them because at least it'll sound different from me. Um, and that show, and then we had the the deconstructible set. So, like, as things were going wrong in the relationship, we could pull pieces off of this flat to symbolize everything kind of crumbling around them. And um, yeah, our set uh, our set was designed by uh, Corey Schmotzer, and he's such an amazing designer. And I, I was so like happy to have him as as our set designer because he looked amazing. It, it looked amazing and it added so much to the story being able to deconstruct that set. It was perfect. Like I couldn't have asked for better. And I'm, I couldn't have asked for a better first attempt at like running a fringe show because I had been in fringe, a fringe show before, like when I was in my first or second year at Abbott and it was, that show went really well too, but it was a totally different experience because that was a comedy show and I was doing, we were doing something more dramatic, which is something I hadn't, seen at fringe like whenever i'd been at fringe i'd only seen comedy shows so i hadn't really seen the more dramatic stuff and it was just really interesting seeing the other side of the coin uh going into that fringe festival and i'm really grateful to have had that experience and to have had like such amazing people working on that show because it wouldn't have been what it was without them because i was i was tearing my i was tearing my hair out i was working like full time and do like trying to do this show at the same time and like paying rent like i was losing my mind honestly though man like fragments like i remember it very vividly amazing show and i'm not just saying that because my most of my ensemble were in it (laughs) but i'm also saying that because brilliantly written the set man like you said incredible yeah and like yeah like just it it really was a beautiful piece and a a great piece to start off with and yeah it's true fringe honestly like we i did find me at one point for fringe Mm -hmm. and that's that's serious but usually it's always comedy or it's always something that like collective it's either it's either it's either comedy collective creation or something so wild and out of the box like that carrot show (laughs) right i heard about it i didn't get to see it i was so upset and i was i was so upset because they were in the venue the venue directly next to us and i could not get a ticket to it because it was sold out all the time i was like damn that or like a one person dance piece or like there's always there's always these different things in the fringe festival man yeah Um, i was like i was i was a little tempted to um to book a spot in fringe and then just do stand up and just like force all my friends to come. <laughs> Honestly, people do do it though. I remember, yeah, I know. Like, I remember seeing one guy was doing stand up, and I was like, "Oh fuck, I could totally just do that. That's smart. That's smart." But then it's gonna be real awkward when there's one person in there, and I gotta do, I gotta do forty five minutes of stand up. Well, one person, <laughs> one to, guy. One person went to a QDF. Like you know how mm-hmm. they have like that that 
spotlight thing at the beginning of fringe yeah. and this guy just went and he just had a whole set he had like his paper still on him and just mm-hmm. did his entire set and then oh, he's wow. like oh okay cool um so that's my time guys <laughs> and he just got off and i'm like okay amazing <laughs> i mean i guess like if you're paying for fringe and you're going doing a show i mean people will go see yeah stand up for sure yeah um actually talking about comedy um yes. and we only have a couple more questions left unfortunately i can do this all day though <laughs> um but the uh let's talk about a midsummer's night's dream um where you played flute so how uh, was, was no i was starving no, i was starving sorry sorry yeah jay was flute <laughs> right but yeah th- honestly the um the mechanicals yes we need to talk about that entire Absolutely. group the troop man had me dying from beginning to end and i need to know how it was for you uh it was really hard to stay serious it was really hard to keep it together because i don't know what it was i think we got midsummer at like a really lucky point when our class was doing okay like we had just i mean our class my class was big and um it had a lot of issues it had a lot of issues there was there were some people who were who were who were i don't know it i think it bred a lot of competition in our class because there were so many of us and we kept doing shows with so few roles of them that felt like they had a lot like responsibility right because i think that's every actor's dream is not necessarily to be a lead but to be something that has some responsibility something that feels like you matter um and we got uh, midsummer like you know we had just done gut girls and and crucible which were two like massive like really amazing shows and i think that like that that competitiveness had simmered a bit and we got into midsummer at a point where all all the guys in our class were getting along famously like we were all like best friends at that point and we did when we did the mechanicals all the people who were mechanicals just had this dynamic to us i mean it was like me and like four of my best friends just acting like actors who didn't know how to act. It's, it was just so much fun. And I think, I think a lot of people, when they, when they saw Midsummer, they were like, Oh my God, like, how are you guys, how are you guys able to be like so funny in a Shakespeare show? And like, sometimes I just tell them outright, like, we were losing our like we we were that's literally just us struggling to stay serious <laughs> we were struggling like it was barely acting at that point because not only did we have like the fairies who were so amazing right especially with like the mixing in of like french and spanish with with Lori and gab like mm-hmm. mixing in language that was phenomenal and then we had the we had the lovers who were like who were really amazing and then we had the mechanicals because not only were we just trying to like stay serious, we were also trying to fuck with each other because that, that like that played more into like just the, the buddy buddiness of, of these mechanicals. And I like, sometimes I remember one show um, when bottom, he, he mimed going out on a horse to go talk to Thisbe, like in the play within the play. Right. And he, he mimed riding a horse out and then he mimed riding it back out, but backwards. And we were all behind that trellis wall, crying, laughing. And I had to go on next with like tears in my eyes. So I was like, oh no. And that's not like, there were times where we would have costume malfunctions and we would just have to, we would just have to roll with it. Like um, Thisbe had this dress, but it was over Flute's costume. <laughs> and so Thisbe, like Flute's pants broke. So I'm behind the trellis wall trying to fix Flute's pants and I can't, and like, <laughs> and so I've got my best friend's ass in my face as I'm trying to fix his pants, and we can't, and I, I have to go on, so I'm like, oh, sh-. and I'm, I'm like, tears in my eyes, so I just go, I just pretend that I'm so afraid to be acting in front of the royals that I'm like having a little bit of a breakdown because I'm trying to hold it together, and then I see Thisbe walk out, and Thisbe had given up. thisbe has got the dress to cover the goods, but I could see that there were no longer pants on those legs. <laughs> and I almost lost my mind. And I was, 
and and I'm like, and and this here is my moon, and I have a dog, and, and I'm just falling apart. And like, it's it's in a show like that where I had maybe four lines, but I remember people like telling me afterwards that like my facial expressions were everything, and that is so like fulfilling it makes you feel so fulfilled as an artist when for like that split second where you're doubting yourself and you're like fuck i only have four lines in this show like what what am i bringing to it and then even that one person who's like your facial expressions had me dying or like that one person who notices that i made it a character choice that starveling couldn't read so I had my script upside down all the time and I was like pretending to try and follow along, but I had no idea what was going on. (laughs) And, and just like when people notice those things, it makes you, I don't know. It makes you feel like you were contributing. Cause I think that's the worst feeling as an, as an actor, when you're acting with all these people who are amazing and then you feel like you're not contributing to it at all. And you feel like in a way you're just weighing things down by being there. And I think it's so important when you, when you get, when you get recognized for just the little things, I don't know. It's really nice. No, I, I completely agree, man. And yeah, just, just playing a clown on stage. Basically. Like it, it's, it's so fun, man. Like it's so liberating too, because like, I'm so used to these like, like rigid structures. I mean, my active teacher is such a phenomenal guy, Terry. I love him to death. And he was very much the kind of person who's like, just explore the world of your character. Right. But there was still some like rigidity to the fact that like this is the time period that you're in. And like he even he even went like with Midsummer, he even made it like post war, like it's the fifties sort of costumes. <laughs> so but even with that, like having just so much looser of a leash, right? Like I think one of one of my favorite things to do every night is when bottom would be like, um, all right, all right, spread out and like choose your spaces or whatever. In rehearsals, what we would do, and I think I think we cut this for some of the shows, but in rehearsals, we would get up from our spots and then wander around the studio aimlessly for like just a teeny bit too long, like just too long enough where it's funny. And then we would go sit back down in the exact same spots. <laughs> And it was just one, it's like those visual comedy moments where you're like, this feels dumb as hell, but I know someone finds this funny. So I keep doing it. I, yeah, no, when I was in Faustus, bro, we had like this troop as well. And like, there was, there was this one point where me and Adrian are like trying to low key, like play up that, like, we might be more than friends, but there was Mm -hmm. only us knowing it you know what i mean so like every time there could possibly be something that made us look like we were more than Mm -hmm. just friends we would play that to hell man seeing seeing the sins come out in faustus was one of my i saw faustus twice um because you got to support your homies you got to support the people you love so i went to see faustus twice and it's still like just seeing the sins all of them come out like with and like because was you were chained to something right like weren't you chained to i I wasn't chained to anything that was adrian adrian was chained right and then you were not (laughs) like watching watching adrian come out with that like treasure chest or whatever and then and then ben eating a cabbage (laughs) and like when it got thrown into the audience i almost (laughs) screamed It scared the hell out of me. (laughs) And then like, and then, and then you were sloth, right? No, I was uh, sloth or, um, and envy. Right. So you had like all that paint on your face, like around your eyes. And, and I saw you like, just like staring at people. And I was like, this is so creepy. This is so, this is fucking with me. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. Like I remember the sins were so much fun to do. And Mm -hmm. like, they're, they're such a smallest role. Like we were just talking about the smallest role but it's at the end of right before like the everything end. you know what i mean yeah. and i'm yeah. like wow like mm-hmm. have that presence like i know obviously with the seven deadly sins like that's scary as it is to hear about yeah them. but like 
<laughs> then like, you have your sloth. name. <laughs> you have sloth coming out and just laying down. Yeah. You have like these little moments that mm-hmm. like people are loving. I had to come out and like soak somebody with wet socks in act right. two. Right. <laughs> and like just like the face, like just dealing with an audience and being mm-hmm. like that funny or being like that over the top. Mm-hmm. it's just something there's something about it even if it is the smallest role yeah if, if someone can come up to you at the end of the show and be like that was hilarious or mm-hmm. i'm terrified of you get away from me <laughs> oh my god <laughs> like i remember there was one point where they're like okay um were you actually bleeding because yeah. bruno i'm like were you actually bleeding and i'm like um maybe <laughs> you know what i mean like you you can play I mean, it up i don't bro. know but like that's the thing like when you're fully invested and it's the smallest amount of mm-hmm. like just you know like you you're having this moment with someone and there's just there's no other place you can really have it yeah. that's also like the funniest things i find are like the funniest moments in shows are the shows that aren't meant to be funny but have a funny moment that just cuts the tension and you're just like oh it's like a moment to breathe, but yeah, Faustus was really good, especially like, especially with people like just Emilio. He's one of the funniest people on the planet. This I I love him so much, and watching his character like the way the three of them would always do like the same, like Emilio. Uh, it was Emilio, Amy, and who else was it? Theo, and Theo. They they made it just in moving i don't understand how characters in just their movements made everything just heightened it was so funny to me watching them just walk around well the uh the pope scene where (laughs) he drank his head i couldn't like i couldn't man like i was was dragged out right before that and i couldn't i couldn't like and then he's screaming through the alcove. I'm like, God damn it, Adrian, man! Like you're gonna break me, man. I know. Oh, it was great. That's the thing, like, bro. Those little moments that, like, if I was this happened a couple years ago, midsummer yeah. happened a couple years ago, and yet we're still talking. Like, Fifteen about dogs was three moment. years ago now, right? Bro, that's nuts. Yeah, that's insane to me because that's like the last time I was in a theater show. Bro. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to think of it like as, I mean, a year of that is a pandemic where we can't do anything, which, oh my God, it's been a year. But like, it's still like thinking of those timelines where you're like, oh my God, it's been a minute. Bro, it's crazy. Yeah. <sighs> well, we have two more questions for you. All right. But before we hop into those, I just want to say who's coming on next week. And it's a good segue because Ooh. it is people from Abbott again. Oh, and yeah. it's actually a huge episode because it's the 30th episode which is nuts to me that that's even happening um but we actually have three guests coming on oh. um and it's going to be um part of all the third years the third years are going to be coming on uh next oh, like current third week, years current third years to talk oh. all things with the pandemic and whatnot so it's going to be a great time i can't wait okay that is going to be a great time oh my god yeah and also terry is retiring now is he yeah this is his last class Oh, I guess we need to get Terry on, guys. So yeah, I know get you Terry. guys have been talking. Or well, I've heard I've heard rumors. I don't know if it's true, so don't quote me on that. But I mean, he says it. He says it every every class he gets. He's like, "This is my last one." This is my but last apparently, one. Apparently, he's been like, pr- I think I think the pandemic really killed killed it for him. But I think I think this one, he's just like, "All right, mm-hmm. I got a good class. I'm ending on a high note." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Honestly, Terry's amazing, and I know you guys have been asking for him because you guys saw (laughs) Alicia, and you guys saw Andy, and you guys want Jason. You guys want a lot of you guys want a lot of teachers, but Terry would be the holy grail if I get Terry on here because Terry Terry would be the holy grail because he's just such a sweet, sweet man. I love him, sweet man, and my God, so much wisdom. Like I don't think I have enough time on the podcast. No, I don't I'm, have enough time on the podcast. I I I love when like he, we would just chat and he'd look at me and he'd be like, "You doing okay?" <laughs> I'd be like, "Oh my god, wait, what?" what, what? And then I just start falling apart. I'm like, "Wait, how do you know? Oh, oh my god, how do you know I'm not doing okay, dude?" Yeah, once once he, he he looked at me. He looked at me. He's like, "Are you on? Are you on a new medication?" And I was like, "How can you tell?" He's like, "Dry mouth." <laughs> 
I was like, fuck. I am. And honestly, guys, like we are laughing. Terry can be hilarious too. The man's funny. I I think I still think like one of my favorite running jokes of his is when he just pretends that he's ancient. Right? Like he'll be like, Oh yeah, so back when I went to see Syracuse, you know, in uh 1738 <laughs> like, wait a minute terry 200 years ago or or he'll just be like oh yeah i'm 30 <laughs> or yes, like he does the there. steal your nose thing all the time and i'm just like that's from like 30 years ago but somehow when you do it it's still funny but only oh. when you do it <laughs> yeah guys we need terry on here we do mm-hmm. we need we need to make that happen yeah um but uh yeah uh, let's hop into the last two questions, uh, okay. which is uh, the first question is, mm-hmm. what are your plans moving forward after the pandemic? Ah, uh, good question. That's a, that's a very good question. I have no idea. I've been, so I was supposed to go to Dalhousie, actually. I was going to go to Dalhousie to uh, get a double major in uh, creative writing and in and acting. And then uh, there was a pandemic. I was supposed to move to Nova Scotia and start Dalhousie last in in like September that that just passed. I was going to move there, but with everything happening and then like my job closing and opening and closing and opening, it's like it's 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 messed with everybody's finances so much. And then I just looked at like my future and I was like, do I really? I was, I mean, I'm thinking about like the future of the world too. And I know that this is a bit of a pessimistic way to look at it, but I was like watching everybody in government continue to drag their feet with, you know, the environment, the, the environmental crisis. And even with the, the response to the pandemic, like still dragging their feet, like a year later, they're like, okay, well, we got to keep schools open. Like if you would just close schools for three weeks, oh. <laughs> but um, I just, I was like, do I really want to be paying off student loans until the world ends? Do, do I really want to be paying student loan, paying back student loans when I'm 80? Like I already have a lot because of college. I was like, do I really want to triple that? Like, so, uh, I scrapped that idea. I'm still moving to Nova Scotia. I'm um, just to be with my family. Um, so I'm spending, roughly a year out there saving money and I'm going to just live out there with my family and just be able to spend time with them and uh, save up some money and move to Vancouver and do my best to make something out of all this shit I'm trying to do. You know, Um, I think, I think also it's just like, I think part of it is I'm trying to run away from Montreal. I'm not sure. I don't blame you, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I But I've been like, I've been trying to get out to Nova Scotia, at least to spend some time with my family for a while. But like every, at every turn, the pandemic has like stopped me from being able to do that. Right. Uh, and I haven't seen them since before the pandemic started. Like the last time, the last time I saw all, all of them was, you know, the January before everything shut down. So it's, it's been, it's been a long time coming that I haven't been able to see my family and I'm not super close with my family that's in Montreal. Um, so I think it'll just be like really healthy for me to get out there, just get away from Montreal for a bit. I think, I think Montreal's kind of bringing me down. But Makes sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's like, that's, that's just the goal is to, get out to Vancouver and start auditioning for as much as I can and try to get my face in front of as many people as I can that might give me a job um, and figure it out from there. But like to say, to say that anything is concrete is a bit of a, it's it's bold of me to assume anything I plan is concrete at this point. You got time, man. And like, (laughs) honestly, like with Vancouver, bro, like every, like there's always something happening over there. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah, and I don't even know, like, I don't know if I want to base myself out of Vancouver or not, but I know that I just want to at least try. I want to try Vancouver. I want to see what it's like, because I'm also like, I mean, I grew up in Florida. I hate the cold. I hate it so much. And like, that's like, that's as close to 
warm as you get <laughs> in True. terms of like it's more mild i guess and like the second it drops below um of oh, zero it's zero is freezing point in celsius right yeah <laughs> so like bef- at whenever it drops below zero i lose my mind i can't handle it i'm a little baby <laughs> Honestly, man, like Vancouver seems like a very good option. And like, yeah. bro, you have an amazing future. How do you? I know you do. I um, hope so. But um, <laughs> the last question actually has okay. to do with anything in regards to um, theater moving forward. Um, mm-hmm. Do you think you're you're going to write anything or perform in theater once it's crazy thing ends? Um, absolutely. I... I took a break. I didn't audition for, for, for theater shows coming straight out of college because I couldn't justify it financially. It's really hard to find any theater work that like pays well enough to justify having to quit your job. Right. And True. at the time when I got out of college, I was, I was working at a grocery store. I was unionized. So I had set hours and I could only, there was only so much leeway in my schedule. And I couldn't justify quitting my job that I needed to pay my rent to do six to like five or six weeks of rehearsal for a show that I might make $200 off of, right? Like a lot of shows, it's like, it's very much the, the unpaid internship of, oh yeah, well you're getting your name out there. And like, I get that that's, you know, if that's, I don't think that that should be the way this industry works, but I also understand that it's very hard to get funding in this industry. So it's like this weird thing that you, there's only so much you can do, but I personally just couldn't, I couldn't make that sacrifice because I, I mean, I moved out when I was 18, the second I got my first job, um, don't speak French, so it's really hard for me to job for to hard for me to get a job in, in the city. Um, and I was like, I just can't take that risk. It's easier for me to audition for film, and if I land something, I know that if anything, I'll have like maybe one line on on like an episode of something. I'll be filming for a day. I can take that day off. If I land anything substantial, then I at least know that it's enough to pay my rent for. a like two three months no right so it's just like i just focused on i just focused on film but i i do love theater so much and i do want to do theater um i know that um our theater company that that i have with with my best friend and my roommate um we we were going to do something for fringe this year but we couldn't so uh i i believe we're eyeing the the next fringe that people can go to so it's probably going to be you know fringe 2022 i don't know i don't know what it's looking like this year but i know that we have a couple of ideas that we're we're exploring um my 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 co uh, artistic director he is um he's mohawk and um he really wants to explore um stories that are you know related to just his heritage or just you know aboriginal heritage in general and and he has a really cool idea for for something that he's been uh he's been researching but i don't know if i'll necessarily act or write on that um i i'm not sure if that's my story to tell (laughs) It's, it's it's not my story to tell but I mean, if, if he asks me for, if, he, if he'd like my assistance on it, of course, I would love to help. But if anything, I'm just, I'm just the other guy helping out, you know, <laughs> for that one. But I definitely am, I'm, I'm working on some, uh, some things right now, just seeing what I can come up with, just to have some, something in my back pocket, you know, for when I'm able to like hit the ground running and start like trying to produce stuff. Because I think it's it's really good for you to have some some stuff in your filing cabinet, you know, like to have a drawer full of ideas or things that are somewhat fleshed out that you can pitch when whenever you meet people who are as driven as you that you might be able to work with or 
I don't know, you find these connections with people and it's easier to maintain those connections if you have something. It's it's really hard to be like, oh, it'd be so cool to work together. Yeah. Do you have any ideas? Fucking no. Like, <laughs> like what do you do at that point? I, so that's why I'm just like stockpiling as much shit as I can come up with just in case. And then, I mean, worst case, I'll just try and do them myself, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, and honestly, man, like all of it sounds great. And I yeah. cannot wait to see what your future holds, man. I know yeah. it's going to be super, super bright. No matter if it's here, Vancouver, Toronto. Yeah. I definitely want to try and uh, I, tr- I want to try and remount fragments at some point. I was think I was you actually should. going to when I was thinking of going to Dalhousie. I was planning on remounting fragments for the Halifax fringe. Um, don't know if I'll still do that, but I do know that I want to. I want to revisit that because I think I could do more with it. Um, just like you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You get more ideas after the fact, and I think I could I could change some things up and make it hit a bit harder, which would be nice because it does hit pretty pretty decently already. <laughs> Um, and I know that like with the, with the theater company that, that we run, we don't always want to write every show that we do. Um, we'd also really like to be able to produce things that like, you know, graduating students or even current students bring to us. If they have ideas, we would love to be able to just help people put those ideas, you know, like create them, make them, bring them to life. Uh, cause I think, I think my, I think Jay and I share the opinion that like, it's not all about us. Like I'm, I'm very much of like the mindset of, I want to see other people succeed so badly. I just, I want that for, for my friends, for everybody. I just, I just long for everybody else's success so much because I just love gassing up my friends, you know? I love seeing them succeed. And if I can be a part of that in any way, that makes me so happy to be able to just do something with them or something for them, you know, to be able to give people a spotlight. That feels, that's just great. Honestly, I don't think there's a better way to end this, man. <laughs> uh, honestly, amazingly put. And before I I sign off, we need, mm-hmm. I need to do, uh, our our segment at the end, which is shining a light on you, man. And honestly, there is there's so much to talk about. Amazing guy, as you can hear. Uh, like, just honestly, like, you have the biggest heart, man. And it's so great to see. You are so talented in acting. Music, keep at it. You're doing amazing with it. And writing, like I said, man, amazing on Fragments. And I know there's so many amazing things coming your way. And like, bro, like I said, your heart, man, keep that. It's great. And more people need to be like that. Thank you. To be honest, more people need to shine bright like that, guys. Like, honestly. Shine bright like a diamond. Shine bright like a diamond, guys. <laughs> um, And yeah, man, like, thank you so much for being on. You're great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is This is great. I love what you're doing. This is so, like, useful for just giving other people a voice and, like, having them be heard and seen. Like, that's so fucking awesome of you to be doing well, thank that's, you that's great thank you for having me thank you thank you so much for being on man and like Absolutely. honestly like that's basically what this is for to <laughs> shine a light on people so i'm yeah. so glad we have another human being that <laughs> shines lights on other people it's so great when people do that yeah thank you so much awesome. man and awesome. we will talk soon okay absolutely thanks for Sounds having me good, bye bud The lights are off, the curtain has fallen, and it's time to say goodbye. Thank you all for joining us on the Little Thespian Podcast. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to ask, either down below or on any of our platforms. On the next episode of the Little Thespian Podcast, we have an amazing band of guests that I am so happy to have on the graduating class of 2021, John Abbott acting. It's going to be a great time. We have Fatima Lopez. We have Mode Lorando Sewell. 
and Mike Master Monaco joining us on the 30th episode of the Little Thespian Podcast. Three guests on the 30th episode. I truly cannot wait and hope you guys cannot wait either. It's going to be a great time with Fatima, Mode, and Mike. It's going to be a great time, guys. And I hope you guys are going to enjoy it. I truly cannot believe that we're already on episode 30. It is astonishing to me that we're already there. And you guys definitely deserve this amazing episode with such bright, bright actors. If you guys want to show some more support, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to us here on YouTube. It helps us tremendously, guys. Also, all our links are always down below. And there's a link to only listen to the podcast if you would like to do that also guys don't forget to ring the bell to stay notified on all future videos because there's much much more coming guys thank you all for joining us thank you dusty for being on this episode and we'll see you all on the next little thespian podcast as we go into our 30th episode thank you all for watching this has been your host matthew crown telling you guys to always shine bright and we'll see you all on the next little thespian podcast